This week on Arts Insight, creating a new world using ink and captions. My style would more closely resemble a mix between Japanese anime and uh, art. The art of paper takes center stage. I like to make it realistic to, to show that, you know, paper is different. An artist who brings his characters to life. The thing that keeps animators going and that keeps me going is this feeling of bringing something to life. And a colony of artisans working together. It doesn't matter who you are, you're going to fit in here because there isn't a standard. Anybody can come here and feel like they're, they can be a part of this. I'm Ernie Manoos, and it's time to get arts in sight. <laughs> Welcome to Arts Insight, coming to you today from the Printing Museum, where you can find everything from a replica of Gutenberg's 1450 Press to newspapers heralding some of America's most historic moments. We'll take a look inside in a moment, but first, comic book artist and author Winston Williams' childhood love of drawing and comic books took him from simply a fan to published graphic novelist. My art is uh, my life. I've been drawing my whole life. All I've ever wanted to do is make comic books. I'm a very creative person. I'm a big daydreamer. So reading a novel, reading nothing but text, my mind would go from one place to another. And I always thought that comic books were a lot more fun because the pictures were there, the story was there, and it, it was just easier to go by. And it was a lot more fun and interesting. My name is Winston Williams, and I am a comic book artist. Joseph Comics is my own publishing company, very small scale for right now. The name of my comic book is called The Soul. The Soul is about a futuristic uh, sci-fi crime drama about a police officer who, through a serious turn of events, becomes a shape-shifting superhero. I always wanted to create a character that looked more like me. I noticed growing up that a lot of superheroes I uh, didn't have too much diversity, in other words. And I wanted you know, kids to grow up and, and look up to something that reflected more of the diversity in our everyday lives. My style would more closely resemble a mix between Japanese anime and uh, traditional American art. When it comes to actually producing the book and actually making the book itself, uh, what we start off with is writing the story. And uh, from writing the story, we'll go to penciling the work, which is just sequential images of whatever is written, put out on paper as if we were to think of it in your head. From there, it's uh, inked. I'll just make any changes that I may feel are necessary from the penciled pages. And after that, it can go into the shading or toning process where we just add depth and three dimension to the pictures. And afterwards, you take uh, what's called lettering. You just put speech bubbles uh, from the written work and you know sound effects um, to just make everything stand out. Once that's done, I'll uh, convert the pictures into uh, print format. And once they're ready to print, then we just go to print and get them made. See my book on the shelf is uh, one of the best feelings I ever, I ever could have asked for. It was kind of on my bucket list. So I was like, well, I don't care, you know, but as long as I can get one book out there, and as long as I can put up for sale, then I'm happy. Comics, for me, it's not tied down. It's, it's, everything is limitless. Not only do you get to express yourself in a visual medium, but you get to tell a story as well. The feeling is indescribable. And you can find out more about Winston's works by visiting jozucomics.com. 
Welcome back to the Museum of Printing History, a gallery that's collecting, preserving, and exhibiting the tools and artistry of printing. Here to tell us more about the museum is curator Keelan Burroughs. Hello there. Hi there. So, a fascinating museum filled with pretty much the history of us. Yep. Now, what I find so interesting is that we think of things often as a term of art, and there is an art form to printing. Talk about that a little. Certainly. Um, the art of printing is definitely tied to a communication about printing and the establishment of printing from early civilization up to the contemporary moment. So, uh, printed imagery and words are how we communicate and how we've transmitted information across time. So. so, it's a lot more than just letters pushed onto paper. When we're talking about printing, it's a full spectrum of who we are as a people. Yes. Some of your favorite artifacts that are here. Some of my favorite artifacts are definitely the presses in this room uh, from the late 19th, early 20th century and the Gutenberg Bible Press. Yeah, talk to me about that one. We were looking at it a few minutes ago and I said, is, is this the real one? Yeah. Uh -huh. And you said, no, nobody actually knows what it looked like. Tell exactly. Me about why. Exactly. Uh, there's no uh, extant examples of printed material that show the press. So basically the press is uh, it's been built, it's replicated, is presumed off of other presses that are um, examples that show the, the presses from that time period. So the press that we have here is a replica that was made by Stephen Pratt, who is, uh, was a gentleman who was uh, based out of Utah. And the press is based off a of a wine press originally, that it's thought to be. Yeah. And uh, it's, really, it's really amazing to see in motion. Yeah, and when you say see in motion, it works. It does work. You can actually use these presses, yes. a lot of them throughout here. Certainly. And people can come and not only see them work, they can learn how to use them too. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the classes. So we do workshops here throughout the year uh, in bookbinding, printing, and various materials and media. And we do a summer book arts program every summer. So you can learn to make a book from making the paper, printing, and binding the book all in one week. And anyone who thinks, well, it's going to be a small museum, you've got a, a good piece of space here, and there's a lot in this area. What, yes. What's in here? And here is our letterpress studio, and it's primarily equipment from the 19th and early 20th century. We have a lot of presses that were used to print various uh, materials and artifacts. A lot of what you see in this room along the walls are the tabletop presses, which were used more in smaller production printing, printing church pamphlets or brochures. Oh, cool. You also, though, have the first actual press used in Texas, correct? Yes, the Samuel Bangs Press. And it's presumed to be the first press used by um, Bangs in Texas. And used for what purpose? Used for disseminating information about Texas independence and news, and it was, uh, he set up shop in Galveston and produced the first Galveston newspaper. Anything else about the museum you think people don't know that they should know about this hidden treasure? Um, we have you know, really unique items about the history of printing that you really can't find anywhere else. You not only get to learn from seeing the materials, but you get to work with them hands-on. We have, in this particular room, cases of historic type, rare type, and wooden type on the back racks here, and it's unusual to be able to find a place where you can actually work on, with these materials. To find out more about everything that goes on here at the museum, where can they go? They can go to our website at www.printingmuseum.org. Thank you. Thank you. Now, for most artists, paper may not be the canvas of choice, but for artist Christine Weigen, it couldn't be more important. I like to make it realistic to, to show that, you know, paper is different. This all started with um, a gift to my in-laws for Christmas. I decided um, to do a scrapbook for them, and I, I started cutting out out pictures, you know, designing each year, and I was using the clip art pictures from the computer. So I would cut each piece out with using, I think I just bought some random cardstock at the store, and I, and they're very simplified, you know, very basic, but it just started layering it, and that's, I went from there, and I thought, oh, maybe I could do this with one of my own photographs, and I, I just started experimenting. After I take a photograph, I use a program called Photoshop, and I'll simplify the lines. I'll look at it, I'll do the composition, I crop it, and then I will do simplify the lines, and then I print it out so that I can use that printout as like a stencil. It is a lot more difficult than just cutting paper. You are um, trying to figure out, you know, what's going to be on. You're working in three-dimensional. You know, you're always working as to where is 
this layer going to be in relationship to this other layer? Because they all have to line up. They all have to you know, go down nice and easily. You can't have this layer. And then when you're ready to put on this other layer, they, they can't be uneven underneath. So you're always working, you're working three-dimensionally. You're working to try to figure out, okay, you're not, you know, you're not just painting a picture. You are, you're like building a picture. That you really have to think about where everything is going to line up to and how it's going, you know, how it's going to look so that the background is behind and, and, you know, the picture's in the foreground. Now, when you get towards the end and you're doing the details, that's more just cutting and putting, you know, those details, but that's what makes it pop. There's tons of pieces. I couldn't even count them. I mean, when you start, obviously, the first layer is going to be like basically a one piece of paper. And then as you get up, you get to this, um, as you work up, you get to the small pieces. And there are tiny pieces. I mean, they are just like little tiny that I need to use my exacto knife blade to like move it over because you just can't pick them up. But for some reason, you need those little pieces. I mean, people, you know, look at it and say, but it, it's amazing how just one little tiny piece transforms the picture. The depth in the piece of my work is just, it, it's a lot with layering. That gives you a little bit of a three dimension to it. And um, with the shadowing, to achieve the shadowing, I do use um, the different shades of the color. And like the grays, I have the different shades that are all set up with the cardstock that I use. So I start with, when I do the picture, it's usually the dark colors that are on the bottom. And I build up to the light colors, which are almost like, you know, the highlights, the, the, the whites are gonna, you know, just touch of white to bring out the highlights of it, where the darks and the shadows are gonna be underneath. They're gonna be the, the behind the, you know, the, the first layer. My, my colors are what they are. I can't like mix them and make, oh, I need this gray a little bit lighter or anything. I, I can't do that. It's, you know, I, I work with my paper. I, all, the, all my picture is all paper. It's not, no paint. Because you don't have, you know, all that range and you have to use what you have. And um, that's why I guess when I say I, I, I try to keep the, the palette neutral, like the grays or the browns when I'm doing like the architecture, the browns work really well with buildings. And then you just add that little bit of color just to bring some interest to it. I, I think my pieces are more just traditional. I mean, I think with the paper, it just lends it to be just like a, a traditional form. They're not, you know, they, they are what the photograph lends them to be. I do like bringing in nature, and I like the animals and the architecture and stuff like that. But I think they're just more, you know, more of a traditional picture. The most difficult part for my for the art, um, I think, is finding the time to do it, to, to be able to sit and, you know, take the time and put it together. To sit and do it. To see more, visit littlegraycatstudio.com. Up next, we got a glimpse into the imagination of animator David Tart as he shows us the long but rewarding process of bringing his characters to life. <laughs> So when we talk about animation, I think we have to start out with what the definition of animation is. And if you look this up in the dictionary, what you'll see is that it reads to bring life to. If we think about movement as opposed to animation, we can go outside in the natural world and, or in the city and we can see a car driving by. And that's certainly moving. Um, we can look at wind blowing through the branches of a tree that's certainly moving, but we wouldn't necessarily say that it was alive. A rock being dropped on the ground, bouncing to a stop, is definitely moving, but it's not animated. So really the quality of animation has to do with that term life, to bring life to. And when when we as human beings think about life, what we think about is personality, emotion, thought, basically a soul. Yeah. 
when I'm animating a character, I have to think about the qualities of emotion, personality, situation, and how those things combine to cause a character to move in a certain way that when viewed by an audience will be taken for life. Communication between two people is largely about nonverbal signs. We pick up a lot more information out of the nonverbal cues. So animators are really, really interested in, in studying and quantifying and recreating those nonverbal cues, the movement essentially, that tells the story of life. Animators draw a lot from method acting, and method acting is basically where you, you put yourself into the imaginary circumstance of that character. So I have a character that's feeling defeated, and I have to go back in my emotional memory a little bit and find some situation in which I felt defeated. And then I also have to feel and recreate what it feels like to move from that feeling to being victorious. From that point, I have to internalize the performance, I have to act it out over and over again, and then I have to start analyzing it very specifically. We'll act something out 20, 30, 50 times, and then we'll start timing things out with a stopwatch. So I'm gonna do that simply by getting into the pose, and then going to my in pose and making a note of how long that took. Because in animation and, and in communication in general, the posture, the overall posture is so important in communicating how that character is feeling. We don't want to take any shortcuts when it comes to examining that posture. We have the ability to continue to tweak it after we've acted it out, which gives animators really the opportunity to create performances and refine posing beyond that which a live actor could do. This is the roadmap. I will use this timing exactly, and we can look at that and how that looks in both stop motion and how that looks on the computer as well. Animation is extremely demanding and especially when you're working on a feature film. There's directors involved, they want a specific performance, you're interacting and collaborating with the whole team of people. Uh, producers can change your performance or uh, change your shot at a moment's notice, and that can, that can get very tough. But the thing that keeps animators going and that keeps me going is this feeling of bringing something that doesn't exist to life. It's an amazing feeling. Ultimately, it boils down to sort of a, a Frankenstein complex. Initially when we're creating characters, a lot of research goes into constructing a character that's believable. In the film, the story of animation, there are three main characters. The main protagonist is named Yu. We wanted him to represent any man. The other main character is the director who works at the animation studio. And then the third uh, main character is the producer. For each of these characters, we had to come up with what's called a character Bible, so that we had something to go on to guide us and inform us and, and to give to the animators to guide and inform them how these characters might move, who they were, how old they are, what their body type is, what their dominant personality traits were. In doing this, we come up with a backstory um, where we give a character a psychological history. 
Animation is accomplished through a frame-by-frame frame manipulation of a character and all the various parts on that character. And it takes quite a while. It takes anywhere between a week to two weeks to finish 10, 12 seconds of animation. For most people, the very idea of sitting in front of a computer or sitting on a stop motion stage and moving a character just a little bit at a time is enough to send them running for the doors. For animators, uh, for one reason or another, we just love this. The day in the life of an animator is filled with ups and downs, but there's always that fascination with the baseline movement and recreating that movement, and that's the common thread among animators. The thing that happens for me uh, that reminds me how much I love animation is that when I sit down to animate a shot and I'm getting lost in those details, how does this finger move? And I'm going forwards and backwards and forwards. <laughs> I'm watching this image go forwards and backwards over and over and over again. And I look up and I notice that three hours has passed. And it's that, the degree that I can get lost in this. It reminds me just how, how much I love it. To learn more about David, check out his IMDb profile. Finally tonight, in the heart of Tampa, a group of artists have come together to create a collaborative and inspiring art colony. I am a painter. I love color. I'm a colorist. That's primarily my passion, is color and energy. So I practice law and I paint. I call it whole brain living. Watercolor is my primary medium. It's my real passion. As an artist, we all like uh, different media. You can do oil painting, acrylics, watercolors, pastels, pencil, charcoal. Um, for me, my chosen medium is graphite, pencil. My idea for the colony as a director is to build a community of like-minded artists to project a positive energy and influence to the city of Tampa about what the arts can be and how it could be a, a tool to help build the city in an even greater way. When you start working with other artists, you start to share ideas and it starts to open up your world. You know, we have little conversations in the hall or in each other's rooms and it's a really great place that we can all connect and come together as a group and try to create another entity of, you know, who we are as a group as well as individuals inside that group. After spending several years at home painting in my garage, I found that um, being around other artists just expanded my professional career as an artist tremendously. Just meeting other people, um, sharing ideas with them, and then being able to uh, find out about other shows. And not only um, as an artist, like as a technique, but also just in knowledge of how to present your art professionally, how to write a bio, how to put your art up on the web. And all these things are things that you benefit from knowing other artists and being involved with a, with a group of other artists, such as the colony here. We, as artists, we smell the same. When you walk in, uh, into the colony and uh, there's a familiarity and one of the metaphors that we hear and send familiarity, oh, this smells like my grandmother's kitchen. And that's just a certain aroma. It's, it doesn't mean it's good or bad, but it's familiar. And once there's a familiarity to it, that you want to, you feel, okay, I'm relaxed. And by that relaxation, it means that you open up to fellowship, to talk, and to expose. And that exposing causes all sorts of other things to go. That's that first domino. <laughs> I love the space in Ybor City. I love the energy of the street. I have this space overlooking 7th Avenue and I love the people walking by and just the energy of the whole experience. You have parades going on, you have people just start singing on the street, you know, reciting poetry. It's amazing. And I'm in the studio and I might cut my CDs off and I just open the window and I get, I'm still getting music. I'm getting the air, the, the streets, the motorcycles, the rumbling. And most of the time it works for me and it just, it gives me a uh, new energy to get back to my paintings and I smell the coffee coming off the street. It's just, it's really a great experience. I grabbed a lot of inspiration whenever I came to Ybor. It has so much 
history and life to it. Uh, there's a lot of culture here, but also a lot of urban decay, which is kind of perfect for me. There's an abandoned streetcar a few blocks from here that no one sees, and I love just finding that and uncovering it. And there's a water tower that's rusted that has so much life to it. I never expected to become an Ebor artist, but there's just so much inspiration to draw from. I just love this room. I feel like everyone should have a room like this where you could just come and turn the music on and dance and paint. It's, it's really, it's a wonderful thing. When you're in Ebor, you'll fit in. It doesn't matter who you are, you're gonna fit in here because there isn't a standard. Anybody can come here and feel like they're, they can be a part of this. And it doesn't matter um, what you're dressed like or what you look like, but you'll always fit in in Ebor. If you don't fit in anywhere else, you will fit in in Ebor City. Here at the Ebor Art Colony, there are so many different kinds of artists. And I think that people would really be surprised if they knew how many creative people we have here, not only in Tampa, but also in St. Pete right now. The, the whole area is bursting with creativity. And I mean, I really think that Tampa St. Pete is gonna be one of the next hubs, kind of like in Austin or New York or San Francisco, because it really is happening. To learn more, visit facebook.com backslash Ebor Art Colony. That's a wrap for this edition of Arts Insight. Join us again next time as we continue to introduce you to artists and their works, both in Houston and across the country. For Houston Public Media, I'm Marie Manus. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.